I'm going to turn it over to Isla Haas, who is going to talk today about COVID-19 and tribes, the structural violence of federal Indian law. And so Isla, um, I'm going to just turn it over to you now. Thank you. Thank you so much and uh, my gratitude to the Academy of Justice for including me today and to all of you for joining. My name is Isla Haas. I'm an assistant professor of law at the University of Tulsa College of Law. So I'm joining you from Tulsa where we had some snow yesterday. And um, I'm grateful to not be by myself at the moment. I'm joined by our, my pup Neville, who conveniently likes to bark at cats uh, during Q&A when I'm speaking. So fingers crossed he behaves himself and sleeps through this one. So I wanted to very quickly acknowledge that the University of Tulsa where I work and uh, my home where I'm joining you from are within the boundaries of the Muscogee Creek Nation Reservation. These are also the ancestral homes of a variety of indigenous peoples, including the Caddo, Osage, Kikamu, among others. And so I am grateful for the opportunity to teach and work and learn on these lands that were unfortunately taken by force. I also want to acknowledge that I am non-native, I'm Iranian American, and while I've been able to spend my career working on tribal public health law issues, it is because I've had um, the privilege of um, being welcomed and being taught by incredible indigenous public health practitioners and leaders. And so for that, I am very grateful and hope that I um, can be an, an ally and advocate. So for folks that aren't familiar with um, tribal nations, I want to give a quick overview. There are 574 federally recognized tribal nations within the boundaries of what's now called the United States. Each tribe is its own sovereign nation and they maintain jurisdiction both over their lands and their people. They have a government to government relationship both with the federal government and with the state governance. Now, Federal recognition under federal Indian law is based on a colonization a genocide. And so part of that recognition has meant that there have been strings attached. And some of those strings has included really complex jurisdictional tests and statutory schemes that govern relationships between tribe states and the federal government. And while the default rule is always tribes maintain authority within their boundaries and over their people, we've got federal laws and policies that have infringed on that. And so when I talk about the complexities of administering healthcare in tribal communities and federal Indian health policy is because of the products of federal Indian law. But make no mistake, um, tribal sovereignty and governance has been exercised since time immemorial. Tribes um, pass law, adjudicate disputes and protect the public health and safety of their people. I also wanna acknowledge even though when we think about law, in political sovereignty in the context of legal system and politics and governments, we can't forget the fact that the whole purpose of political sovereignty is to protect tribal cultural sovereignty. So uh, the ultimate goal of political sovereignty is protecting a way of life because when the federal government or state governments have jurisdiction or authority over tribal lands or their members, we've seen the undermining of tribal sovereignty and the goal of eliminating tribal cultures, even when those policies are considered to be neutral on their face. I want to quickly talk about some health inequities and resiliencies in the context of American Indian Alaska Native communities during the COVID-19 pandemic. So, um, Yes, it is devastating to see the impact of COVID-19 um, for some tribal communities. So we're seeing higher rates of infections as compared to other groups. We're seeing worse health outcomes as compared to uh, outer groups. And, and just uh, an hour before I am joining you here now, I saw a report from Indian Country Today that a 17-year-old girl, a member of the Salt River Maricopa, Pima Maricopa Indian community died 17 years old. Um, and uh, these adverse health outcomes and these deaths are absolutely avoidable. And I'm going to be talking about how federal law perpetuates them. 
I also want to acknowledge because so much stereotyping goes on in terms of Native communities and American Indians, Alaska Natives. And while, yes, um, we have seen in COVID-19 and other health issues, health inequities, there's also tribal resiliencies. So tribes exercising their inherent public health authority to use CARES Act funding creatively, to leverage their community and cultural infrastructures that their state, federal, and local counterparts just can't tap into in the same way to mitigate gaps in federal law and policy. And so what are some of those gaps? I want to remind everyone that the federal government by treaty, which under the Constitution are considered the supreme law of the land, and the federal trust responsibility, which has been continuously acknowledged both by the Supreme Court, Congress, the executive branch, is required to provide health care to American Indians and Alaska Natives. Yet they have continued to, they being the federal government, federal agencies, reneged on these responsibilities, both what's been required by treaty but, and by statute. And so what are examples of that? The chronic underfunding of Indian health facilities. The adding additional administrative and programmatic requirements to get funding to supplement existing federal Indian health plans and facilities through programs like and then strategic uh, special diabetes programs for Indian strategic national stockpile. And so all of these provisions, even the ones that look like they're providing access and funding to tribes are already obligated to be provided under federal law. And unfortunately are inconsistently not being provided um, infrastructure, inadequate access to water. Um, federal government is required to provide meaningful government to government, nation to nation consultation when they are taking actions that are going to be impacting the health and welfare of tribes and American Indians, Alaska Natives. Um, and here too, very few people would say that consultation has ever been effective by the federal government, even though they have the tools to for effective comp um, consultation. And I could go on and on, but want to acknowledge one important point that federal, the federal trust responsibility to tribes and American Indians, Alaska Native communities includes protecting tribal rights under federal Indian law and includes protecting tribal sovereignty from state infringement. And in the context of public health, we see continuously state infringement of tribal authority at the expense of tribal communities. And so why does this matter? Federal law, whether it is foundational federal Indian law policies, whether it is specific federal Indian health policies has led to structural violence, historical trauma, and incredibly high um, adverse childhood experience scores. And all of these areas are linked to adverse health outcomes. And so unfortunately, COVID-19 fits as another example within this framework where we see federal law perpetuating inequalities. And why does this matter, even though, like I said, tribes have been able to mitigate some of these failures, they can't whole cloth undo infrastructure that has been established over hundreds of years that have literally been put into place in order to undermine tribal sovereignty, tribal cultures, and to limit access to tribal lands, tribal sacred sites. Again, all of these are important cultural, environmental, and community infrastructure that makes it easier for tribes to engage in their governance. And in turn, when we think in the context of COVID-19, protect their community. I'm gonna um, pass the baton over to my colleagues to talk about some of uh, their comments, but I just wanna acknowledge that um, this has been a difficult year. I've been struggling to find joy in um, the work that I do every day. And I know that has been a struggle for all of you. And so I just want you to know that I, I see you um, keeping on the good fight in whatever sphere of the universe that you're in. And I'm grateful for all the work that you're doing to keeping us as healthy and safe as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isla, for the, thank you so much, Isla, for those words. I. Um, I think it's very important work that you're doing in Indian country, and I'm just so glad that you can join us. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to our next presenter right now, and then we'll do questions at the end so that um, we have time to get some questions from the audience and then um, talks amongst ourselves. But our next speaker is Heather Tanana from the University of Utah, 
And Heather, do you want to go ahead and start your presentation? Yeah, well, thank you, Kate. And thank you, Isla, for that really great introduction and background. My presentation really builds off of what Isla started for us. So, yes, Eish E Heather Tanana Yenishe, Dene E Nishle, Shema E Belagana Nele, Ado Shije E Kiani. So I am of European descent on my mother's side, on my father's side, uh, my clans are the Towering House and Black Street Woods people. So if there's any relatives out there that might be listening. So as Isla really set the stage for us, the conditions that uh, tribal communities are facing right now, um, certainly COVID has highlighted the disparities and inequities, but they're not new and they are very much rooted in the federal policies that have been implemented uh, really since before this country was even formed. And so for my presentation, I want to highlight um, the mental health in these tribal communities. So certainly mental health issues have been a challenge for everyone during the pandemic, right? There's a New York Times article not too long ago about uh, teenagers in the United States, um, how we're seeing increased anxiety, um, depression, right? This is happening um, broadly across the United States. But once again, for our tribal communities, it's um, even more emphasized and dramatic because the conditions uh, for many Native Americans before the pandemic hit uh, were dire. They had uh, higher rates of serious psychological distress, 2.5 times the general population, right? Youth suicide um, was an epidemic of its own. There were two times the suicide death rates um, for our Native youth. Alcohol and substance abuse was um, rampant. And when COVID hit and the pandemic occurred, the problem just got worse. We heard increasing reports of overdoses. Uh, you know, certainly the research from this is going to take some time to develop, but initially the Canadian government, they conducted a survey of their citizens and among their indigenous respondents, they found a heightened uh, response of Indigenous people, First Nations people reporting that they were suffering more mental health challenges. Um, again, higher rates of substance abuse, alcohol use, and depression, suicidal thoughts. So we knew this was a problem before the pandemic. And again, what Isla emphasized is that the federal government's role in that and the history. Um, but if we look at mental health kind of services and access, there are various challenges that were in place that made these higher rates uh, result. And there is a study done to look at individuals who went to IHS or tribal facilities for services and what were the barriers to receiving mental health services specifically. And what the study found was that the participants reported three broad categories. Um, half of them said the physical there was some sort of physical barrier that the distance to travel to get services, um, they lacked transportation period, uh, something related to having to travel or get to the services physically, that was a barrier for uh, more than half of the participants. A third of them reported that they had some personal barrier, the lack of childcare, their work schedule or personal schedule, um, prohibited them from accessing services. And then there were uh, also a third of the respondents that reported there was some sort of economic barrier, uh, you know, either financially, um, sometimes the IHS facility uh, or tribal facility didn't have the specialists or service needed. So the individual got referred outside of those networks and then they were subject to co-pays that they couldn't pay. So again, I really want to emphasize, right, that when we're talking about mental health services, health services in general, there were real challenges before the pandemic happened. And then the pandemic occurred and made it um, difficult to address. And, and what my uh, kind of paper for the symposium talked about was 
how, how can we increase access to these services? How can we address some of those barriers that the respondents mentioned? And one potential outcome or option is using telehealth services. So I wanted to mention briefly, um, some people use the terms telehealth, telemedicine interchangeably. Um, telehealth is a little bit broader, but again, we're seeing such an increase in use of uh, telehealth. I'm going to use that term throughout my presentation. I think these terms are kind of evolving as we go, but just be aware they're not quite um, exactly the same. And there's even uh, a whole series of what constitutes telehealth, different types of visits and that sort of thing. So how has telehealth changed before COVID versus after? So before COVID, it was being used in Indian health facilities, tribal facilities. Um, we know that the mental health, substance abuse, alcohol, those treatment programs have been severely underfunded. In general, you know, Isla didn't mention this, but anyone who's familiar with kind of the systems, we know that Indian Health Service, the primary agency responsible for providing health care services to Native Americans in this country, has been chronically underfunded since it was established, right? And so it's a challenge to get more service, more access to community members when you don't have um, the money to do that. And so telemedicine and telehealth was viewed as one option. Okay, if we don't have enough health care providers in uh, tribal communities, particularly um, the more, um, you know, the specific expertise or specialists, those can be particularly hard to get. They cost more money, right? We can have more um, physician assistants than we can have physicians. And heaven forbid, if you actually try and need a cardiologist on staff, right? They just cost more. And so telehealth was viewed as a way to be able to access those specialty services, be able to consult with a specialist when you needed them without having to have them um, full time on your payroll. And so in 2008, uh, Indian Health Service established their Telebehavioral Health Center of Excellent, uh, Excellence. And we saw um, Alaska was really utilizing these services. They um, started actually before the 2008 and 2001, they started their Alaska Federal Health Care Access Networks and really were kind of a pioneer in using telehealth to get services to members of the community who lived in very rural locations. And they saw significant savings, um, more than 70% of consultations to a specialist occurred without you know, through telehealth without having to have the individual travel to that specialist, it saved them eight to $10 million annually. And so the similarly, the Telebehavioral Health Center of Excellence with IHS also saw some successes. Um, but it was mostly uh, being used previously to the tele the focus on mental health that was really being used again, cardiology, um, eye care, nutrition counseling. But since 2008, we've seen this increase with kind of mental health services and a really interesting uh, result of, of using telehealth is that, um, again, kind of a survey was conducted and the participants reported uh, 2.5 times more likely, the people utilizing telehealth services were more likely to keep a telepsychiatry appointment than an in-person appointment. And the telehealth kind of participants reported that they felt their confidentiality was more likely to be protected in telehealth, mental health service um, appointments as opposed to in person. Uh, you know, there was a concern of individuals that when they went to the grocery store, they would run into their uh, therapist that would be kind of embarrassing. You didn't want to acknowledge them and have other people recognize that maybe you were seeking mental health services. We've also heard accounts, right, in very small communities when someone goes into the clinic and they walk down that wing where everybody knows the mental health providers are, 
then all of a sudden everyone in the community knows that you were seeking mental health services. And so telehealth um, provided that opportunity to for an individual to seek help and assistance without feeling like everyone else in the community knew it. So it was making progress before the pandemic, it seemed to be a good means method of providing mental health services. And then pandemic happened and all of a sudden it really was the primary means we had to do it to, to um, in light of the kind of stay at home or social distancing orders. So the use of telehealth has dramatically increased uh, initial data, right? Since, um, and this is for all healthcare beneficiaries, not just mental health services, but it increased from 14,000 to 1.7 million in just end of April of this year. So what helped to facilitate that broad use of, of telehealth services? Um, it was changes to um, CMS and Medicaid, Medicare billing, right? Again, with the chronic underfunding of Indian Health Services, historically IHS and tribes um, well, not historically, more recently, they have started when they're able to bill CMS. And that's a way to fill the gap in the funding. Not certainly not the entire gap can be filled, but some of it can be by seeking private insurance billing um, or CMS billing. And so before COVID, the reimbursement rates for a telehealth uh, service was 14 to $41. And that has more than doubled now the reimbursement rates are 46 to 110. There are also changes to the requirements about location, where the services have to be um, furnished and where the provider is, where the recipient is, what means of communication you're using. Does it, it no longer has to be a two-way real-time interactive. Some services can be done with an audio only telephone uh, and then pre-COVID, there were requirements, you know, that, that first, even if you use telehealth, that first visit still sometimes had to occur in person to do that initial evaluation. And some that has been waived in certain circumstances. So these changes that we've seen to CMS, other private insurances have followed them, mirrored them, but it's opened up the ability to um, utilize telehealth more broadly in IHS and tribal systems. Now, it's not a perfect solution, my last slide here, right? Because we also know, um, and Isla highlighted, there are underlying challenges. Telehealth will not fix the broken uh, federal trust responsibility, right? Um, the federal government still needs to fully fund and fully uphold their promises. You can't implement telehealth services if you don't have broadband or good um, cell phone connections, right? It relies on technology and equipment that is more often than not is lacking in some of our more rural tribal communities. Um, and then we still, even though participants felt like a telehealth visit would they maintain their confidentiality, right? We still wanna make sure we're protecting and ensuring privacy um, in our rush to kind of implement telehealth broadly. There have been, uh, some of the regulations have been laxed, but we want to make sure that we are protecting that individual's privacy, that their health information is protected. Um, and as we have lockdowns, right? Sometimes it's hard to get in a room alone without having a lot of family members behind you. And then again, more broadly, we also just need to look at the effects. And that has been, there was an executive order, um, you know, that the secretary of HHS proposed regulations for the long-term use of telehealth. Again, all of these COVID measures, they're temporary right now. So we need more long-term permanent solutions and we need to make sure it's done in a way that um, promotes patient privacy, patient safety, and all of those considerations. All right. So. Thank, thank you so much for that. Um, and it is interesting. I mean, I don't think that many people realize how underserved Indian country is by Wi-Fi and 
even electricity. And so um, these are big issues that Indian country is facing. Um, I'm happy to next, announce our next speaker who's coming to us from Spain. And um, she's gonna talk to us today about what her country went through and what they did in the early stages of the pandemic, um, especially as it affected childbirth and pregnancy. So Angel Canos, I'll let you um, take the stage. Thank you. I think it's good afternoon for you. Uh, good afternoon to, uh, for everyone, to everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Arizona State Journal, Journal and the Academy for Justice, Jennifer Oliva, Oliva was, who was the one who signed the first call for papers, and you, Kathleen Rossier, our moderator, and all to, uh, who have made possible this event. I'm uh, very pleased to be, to, to be able to participate uh, from Spain in this virtual symposium on COVID and vulnerable population. Um, and second, I would like to apologize. In my English, it's not good enough. I only hope I will be able to expose four or five basic ideas and some sort of conclusions. Our paper, and I'll, I say, I'll talk about our paper because I am only the co-author, but the other co-authors hasn't been able to be yeah, now because we have a, la a, a lack of time. So for us, it's um, almost, uh, I mean, it's very late. And um, uh, our paper was called um, uh, Containment Measure Effects on Pregnancy and Childbirth, and was focused on the, um, the practice, the first protocol supplied in Spain and other Spanish countries. I'm going to share my presentation. I hope I'll be able to do it. Um, okay, I think you can see it. So um, the context, the, that's the, our, our work, those containment measures. And uh, I would like to underline the context. Women and girls have been more affected by this health emergency. Usually, and I think it, have, it has already been said, uh, vulnerable populations are always, or the most vulnerable, uh, are always the more affected in any emergency. So that's the case of women and uh, girls. Uh, labor, and that's the second idea I'm going to try to, to expose. Labor and childhood, uh, and childbirth, sorry, are significant events in the life of women. And because of this, they need a special care. And um, this care during pregnancy and childbirth needs to be encompassed basic human rights, including, of course, the respect, dignity, confidentiality, information, and informed consent, and the right to a higher standard of health and freedom from discrimination and other forms of ill treatment. And the fourth idea I'm going to develop very shortly or very quick is that the fight against disrespect and abuse against women during childbirth has been placed in the global public health agenda and uh, was uh, World Health Organization recommendation on antenatal uh, for a positive uh, pregnancy experience launched in 2016. And, um, Nevertheless, the, the guideline recommending induction of labor in order to avoid unnecessary geological complications in an already sick fashion, the paper recommended another paper we are going to, I'm going to expose it, the isolation of newborns of COVID-19 positive mother and discourage breastfeeding. So uh, the disease outbreaks, as I told you, as the first idea, affect women and men differently in all areas from health or economy to security or social. And the fight against COVID-19 has not been, is not different. Efforts to, to stop the spread of COVID-19 have or are disproportionately affecting women. As an example, the closure of a school as a measure to control transmission has a differential effect on women who provide most of the informal care within families with the consequences of uh, limiting the work and economic opportuni opportunities, while the confinement, confinement measures increase the risk 
of intimate partner violence and other forms of domestic violence due to heightened tensions in the household. Among all those negative effects, we focus only on those that happen in a very particular aspect or moment of the life of women, pregnancy and childbirth. Indeed, the emergency response has meant that resources for sexual and reproductive health services have been diverted to deal with the new challenge. And many pregnant women have been or are isolated at home, a pet up and see ah, a passive about clinic exposure or unable to access vital health services because of lockdown. And this uh, happened when it's also well known that labor and childbirth are psychologically significant events in the life of women with a known neurobiological and hormonal basis strongly influenced by social cultural context. And lucky enough, during the last three decades, the issue of disrespect and abuse against women during childbirth has been placed in this global uh, public health agenda. And for example, what I told you, the, uh, what I underlined as the third idea, the World Health Organization recommendation on antenatal and perinatal um, cares for a positive pregnancy experience were launched in November 2016. Whatsoever respectful maternity care begins while, well before pregnancy. Women's mental health is predominantly supported by rational, experiential, and material factors. Usually, Maternal mental health problems as postpartum depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorders affect up to 20% of women and after childbirth. Some associated risk factors described include high anxiety levels during pregnancy, the fear of delivery, instrumental deliveries, and the perceived lack of intrapartum care or the absence of the chosen, chosen birth companion as well as the lack of consent to certain intervention or stars interaction with the health professionals involved. All of these circumstances have been increased during the health crisis created by SARS-CoV-2. And in addition to this already a stressful set of circumstances, many hospitals have implemented a number of restrictions and interventions during childbirth that are not based on any scientific evidence respecting women's dignity. In particular, regarding maternal and newborn health, World Health Organization has stated that reduction in access to and utilization of uh, essential maternal and newborn health services during epidemics translate into important increases of the number of women and newborn that who suffer complication or die during pregnancy, childbirth, and the postnatal period. The third important idea, care during pregnancy and childbirth needs to encompass basic human rights, including the right to respect, dignity, confidentiality, information, and informed consent, the right to the highest attainable standard of health and freedom from discrimination and from all forms of ill treatment. A woman's autonomy should be recognized and respected, ensure her emotional well being, choices, and preferences, including the right to have a companion of choice during labor and childbirth. Respect and recognition of women can benefit newborns who have also rights and require respect and recognition. Nevertheless, human rights of women and their baby may have been violated by the introduction in many countries of inappropriate protocols regarding pregnancy management, delivery, and postnatal care in response to recurrent coronavirus disease, COVID-19. On March, on March 2020, some authors, authors published a guideline which, they, which suggested that there was no evidence of vertical transmission of coronavirus during pregnancy and only one reported case of suspected perinatal transmission. In spite of this, induction of labor was recommended in order to avoid unnecessary surgical complications in an already sick patient. Moreover, the paper recommended the isolation of new births, isolation, 
of new births of 19 positive mothers and discouraged breast, uh, breastfeeding. In the onset of the pandemic, those recommendations had a big impact in Spanish speaking countries and were assumed by many hospitals, such as deliveries without a birth companion, or in those cases where uh, there was uh, SARS CoV 2 positivity, was suspected early mother child separation and banning skin to skin contact as well as breastfeeding. And these practices were endorsed despite the fact that the isolation of newborns and the restriction on breast uh, feeding are known, are known to lead to long-term consequence, consequences, which could be harmful if applied to the general population. This potentially traumatic practice and the discontinuation of antenatal, antenatal follow-ups represent blunted violations of both women and newborns' rights as well as rapidly changing and erratic protocols of the cancellation of antenatal examination. So, introduction in many countries of inappropriate protocols not based in current reputable evidence for management of pregnancy, birth, and postnatal care in response to COVID-19 pandemic has meant the violation of human rights of women and their babies when quality health services should always be uh, safe. Our main conclusions are that the introduction in those countries or in many countries of those uh, inappropriate protocols, um, as I said, already said, not based in current reputable evidence for management of uh, pregnancy, birth, and postnatal care. Uh, has meant violation of women human rights and their babies and the high levels of uh, anxiety mothers have faced making um, many of them feel that the deliveries have been stolen will have in the medium and long term we expect an impact on public mental health thank you very much Thank you for sharing that. I'm really shocked. Um, I haven't heard much about the taking of the babies. And so I think that's a really uh, interesting thing to share with everyone. Sorry for my daughter and my dog, it's a uh, <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> but um, I guess my question, my first question for you, um, Angel is, has anybody, has there been protests in your country or any actions? Um, taken maybe on a human rights front that advanced um, towards the government? No, there have been some reactions from the psychiatry sector. Some, some uh, doctors have um, made some studies that have uh, published uh, their, con their opinion about those practices. And finally, after the first impact, the first two, three months, uh, practice has been relaxing and there are no uh, any more separation between mothers and child. But uh, for the first six, seven, eight weeks, it was horrible. There was silence and those practice. Of course, there, there, was, there wasn't a, uh, a very uh, uh, easy communication between mothers and mothers having babies because we were under uh, restrictions of freedom of movement. We were close at home. So it was almost impossible, only uh, social media source. Uh, WhatsApp and, and those things, but there was no contact. So all the groups uh, of mothers uh, were suspended. So there were no contact between mothers. There were no, um, the, the usual revisions. There were uh, those, uh, all those uh, antenatal care uh, were suspended. So there was no any contact between doctors, nurses, mothers. So it was quite difficult. And I think the first reaction came from not human rights defenders, but from uh, doctors, from the medical sector that said that it was not founded, those practices weren't founded, and the protocols were changed. There was some kind of reaction in some, some letters from doctors in social media, the newspapers, and finally the, the change the, of those protocols adopted in every single hospital, more or less. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. And um, Heather, you mentioned that some of that has happened here in the States. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, so 
you know, it's it's interesting. I think when a lot of media attention was focused on Indian country and the rising case numbers back in the spring, there was a hospital in Albuquerque, uh, Lovelace Women's Hospital that implemented this secret policy to remove uh, babies from women that looked like they were native. And, and they did, you know, again, mothers didn't know what was happening and ProPublica, I'll have to drop it in the chat. They were the ones that kind of uncovered this policy. And until media attention, it's like, until you get caught, right? You kind of keep doing it and then you get caught and they all of a sudden apologized. Right, thank you. Um, for our participants who are watching, feel free to drop any questions into the chat if you have them. Um, if not, we will continue um, talking and sharing our questions um, amongst ourselves. Um, one of the questions I have about um, on the tribal side is, you know, who is really responsible for this? We saw in South Dakota when one of the tribes wanted to really take a stance and try to protect their community, there was a lot of pushback from the states. So who, who is responsible for protecting these communities? And I'll maybe direct that question to Isla or Heather, whoever feels more comfortable. Do you want to go first, Isla, since that kind of fit with yours? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for that question. Uh, so it's important to acknowledge that um, tribes of sovereign nations, they have inherent authority to protect public health and safety within the reservation and uh, for their citizens. So tribes have a responsibility and as any sovereign, sovereign government, they also have a duty. It is a responsibility that a government's owe to their citizens to promote public health and safety. When we're talking about the overlay of federal Indian law, it gets more complicated than that. The federal government through uh, treaty and other legal commitments is also obligated to provide health care it is obligated to provide education, obligations regarding infrastructure, public health and safety. And that a, long, a lot of times also has a concurrent jurisdiction component. So when we think about criminal justice, um, certain areas of civil jurisdiction, so anything besides criminal jurisdiction. So the federal government also has a duty to um, support tribes. Um, and so folks like me would argue um, so long as it is working in coordination and with approval with tribes, that doesn't always happen. Um, so that the best tools are gonna be used um, within their communities. The other piece of this that gets really complex is although the default rule is states don't have jurisdiction within um, tribal lands, we, federal Indian law has dictated, again, folks like me and others would say, unfortunately, that states can assert some jurisdiction and while that's remarkably limited in the context of public health, that doesn't mean that they don't have a responsibility to work alongside their tribal partners to ensure that there is proper intergovernmental coordination. And tribal citizens are also citizens of the state. And many, many tribal citizens live outside the boundaries of the reservation. And so if states are not properly consulting tribes and properly engaging their American Indian Alaska Native communities, that again is reneging on their responsibilities. Now, where things in the context of um, South Dakota and, and frankly other state and local governments is states ignoring the fact that tribes are gonna have primary jurisdiction on public health issues, states no jurisdiction and the federal government some concurrent jurisdiction and trying to assert their views of whether it's about tribal checkpoints um, mass mandates, uh, contact tracing, data access. And so that's where we see that kind of um, complexities and conflicts. So tribes has primary responsibility, but that doesn't mean the state and federal government don't have duties and responsibilities, but that needs to be in conjunction and coordination with tribal responses. Heather, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Yeah, no, I think Isla hit it right on the nail, right? Going back to these treaty response responsibilities, I don't think the federal government should ever be relieved of that either from inaction, you know, and, and that's what our McGirt case says, just because they haven't acted on it for so long, it doesn't suddenly um, uh, get rid of their responsibilities or commitments. But on the same, at the same time, I think we also need to be a little realistic. 
um, and tribes having their own independent you know, responsibility to their citizens, I think that's where we get a lot of them being creative to fill in that gap. And it's a challenge with the infrastructure, right? Tribes, these communities, they don't exist in, in these bubbles. A lot of times the boundaries are not very clear cut, especially with our kind of checkerboard. Oh, you're on tribal land, now you're not. And you know, I think that is particularly a challenge when we're talking about these infrastructure issues, bringing in water, bringing in broadband. Um, and I'd love to see more cooperation and coordination, um, but it, it's just still a challenge, right? We're seeing in Arizona where the, the tribes there along our Colorado River Basin, they're trying to get water in to their communities. Um, but water settlement talks to um, figure out the rights. The state is trying to bring in other issues that are unrelated, okay? You know, you have to settle, you know, deal with this gaming and gambling issue to in order for us to talk about water. And and it's it's mixing up and holding, trying to hold tribes, I think, captive to a state agenda. And so again, in an ideal world, all three of these sovereigns should be working together for just the citizens so that we have the same standard of living uh, down on Navajo Nation as we do up here in Salt Lake City. Um, but I think we still have a, a bit of a ways to go until we see that. Thank you. Um, I thought maybe we could talk a little bit. We got a little bit of time to talk about some of the mental health issues that we see coming out of this pandemic. And um, Angel, I don't know if you want to share a little bit about what you're seeing as some of the um, main risks to some of these mothers that you're seeing. Oops, you're on mute, Angel. Angel, you're on mute. Sorry, excuse me, I was on mute. Thank you, Kate. Oh my God. Okay, um, I'm going to try to explain it, even if I'm not the expert, because I'm the lawyer and my co author is the expert, but uh, she rather, uh, she can call me, please, <laughs> uh, because we work together sometimes. Okay, mm, most of those um, mother, infant, uh, separation after birth, birth have been uh, as a common practice during those first stage of COVID. And um, according to the normalistic neuroscience, the intimate contact between a mother and her baby evokes neurobehaviors that sequential the fulfillment of basic biological needs. So this early contact may also help keep mom, but babies warm and calm and improve other aspects of the, their transmission, transition to life outside the, the womb. So the separation may, uh, this early separation may disrupt or interrupt uh, those uh, developments, very absolutely essential for the new life. The period of time immediately after birth may represent a sensitive, what is called a sensitive period for programming future psychology and behavior of the child. So a skin to a skin contact has also shown show to lower maternal stress levels. And despite the fact that scientific evidence supports the benefits of early mother and baby skin to skin contact, as well as the surrogate, in order to prevent postpartum depression and anxiety disorders. So, so those are the practices. So what uh, we expect, what psychiatrists expect is the uh, increase of those uh, depressions and anxiety disorders of mothers. And uh, we don't know which or where or what are going to be the consequences on the new babies, on the newborns, on the um, all the measures, the containment measures, and this case in particular, are obviously affecting mental health. So there's going to be a great work in the future in order to suppress the consequences of those containment, uh, containment measures. With, uh, I don't know if with a real uh, knowledge of the consequences. I don't know if I, I have answered your question, Kate. 
No, now it's you are mute. Oh, now it's you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, any other things that we should be watching for on the tribal front as a result of this lockdown on mental health? I think that'd probably be you, Heather. Yeah. You know, I, there's been research and evidence showing that um, for Native youth, Native adults, that when they engage in kind of cultural practices, that that is pr a protector against mental health issues. And with the pandemic, right, we can't gather in the same way, can't have our powwows, have our, um, our ceremonies in the same way. And so that, I think, has been a challenge. Um, Zoom, I'll tell you, you know, here in, in Salt Lake, they the school district does a great um, Title VI education. They try to get the native kids together, and it's the kids are zoomed out. <laughs> you know, so I've just noticed it's a it's a barrier, I think, for people to feel connected to their community, um, and that leads to the feelings of isolation, which can have take a toll on its mental health. Um, and, and again, tying back in infrastructure, right? The Zoom and kind of remote gatherings can try to fill that gap, it's not the same, but if you don't have a reliable connection, you know, you, you can't even do that, so. Right. Thank you guys so much. We are at our time limit for our portion of the program. And so I wanna thank all three of you for presenting, uh, four of you for your thoughts on your paper and joining us from Spain and Tulsa and Utah. And I especially again want to thank um, Valina and uh, Dawn for putting this program together. And I think it's important to hear some of the challenges that these underserved communities have had. Um, I personally was shocked about the, the, the babies and we know about the, the challenges in Indian country. Um, so thanks again to all of you and Valina, I'll hand it back to you. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I, I learned a lot from that uh, presentation, series of presentations and discussion. And I just wanna remind everyone that the essays are published with the Arizona State Law Journal online. Uh, and I wanna give a particular thanks to Dean Rozier uh, for leading this discussion and for all of her work as director of our Indian Law Program at Arizona State University, Sandra D. O'Connor College of Law. And I'll put a link to their webpage in the chat as well. So for anyone who has um, felt particularly engaged by this discussion, you can also look at the great work that the Indian Law Program is doing as well. Uh, so um, we're going to take another five minute break. Uh, I look forward to seeing all of you back at the top of the hour when we're going to have our keynote speaker, Professor Requia Yerby. Uh, so thank you everyone. <laughs>